That was the C minor etude by Prokofiev from the Opus 2 set of four etudes. This is the third, and I think this is probably the most difficult of the four. It's a very tricky etude. It's one of my personal favorites, so let's talk about it a little bit. Um, as usual, I'm going to talk about how difficult it is, uh, what those diff you know, why is it so difficult, what the difficulties are, whether I think it's an effective etude, um, worth learning just for the technical improvement if there is any. And then I'll talk about the practice techniques or how I went through it and practiced it and what worked best for me. Um, I certainly am not the master of this piece. As usual, this, you know, the pieces I show are usually works in progress. As I practice them, I kind of record and talk about it. But this piece in particular is difficult enough that I think it's going to be in my life for, for a while. And uh, hopefully, you know, a couple decades from now, maybe I'll give a good performance of it. I guess I've already said this thing is very, very difficult. Uh, so why? First of all, it's, it requires a lot of finger dexterity, right? Anything that requires kind of this independence of fingers, 
you know, where each finger has to kind of have a mind of its own and give its own articulation. That stuff's always difficult, especially when it's at a very fast tempo like this etude. There's also the fact that if I had to summarize, you know, if you had to pick a theme for the etude, I think the interval of a third is probably one of the themes of this etude or one of the recurring difficulties. And thirds are always tricky for me. Some people have hands where thirds are super comfortable for them. I'm not one of those people. Um, and Prokofiev definitely uses different types of thirds, right? The clearest example of thirds is the double, not double thirds, is the very fast thirds in the left hand, chromatic. Not so bad, right? Chromatic thirds, um, as long as you have the right fingering, that's okay. But he also has a variety of broken and consecutive thirds in the filigree passages that we'll get to. So, let's talk about the piece. This is a really well-constructed, very interesting piece. Um, I'm not going to call it a four-voice piece, but we can say that it has four parts, right? And there are two, I think there are two themes, and then there's kind of this filigree stuff. So let's see how Prokofiev constructs this, right? So the first thing that he introduces is one of the themes, and it's at a slow, fairly slow tempo. It's Andante. Okay, that's our first theme. And that thing happens throughout this introduction. I call the, the, the slower part is the introduction. Um, he then introduces what I'll call kind of filigree one and accompaniment. Um, filigree, it's, it's this broken third stuff. You know, I don't think that's really a theme, right? It's just background pattern or, or whatnot. It's tricky. And we'll talk about how I practice it, but that's, you know, one of the... Uh, so we have a theme, and now we have this filigree. And then we have the left hand, which gives us kind of a basic chord accompaniment. And that's kind of the first thing. That, that's, how the, that's how he constructs this first introduction section. Those are our three parts, right? So we have the theme, and then he combines... Um, then we hit a presto section, right? We get into the presto, and then I'd say the etude really starts. And he still uses the theme, right? The theme from earlier, but it's in conjunction with the stuff he's already introduced, which means now the right hand has to play two things at once. It plays the filigree. And then it has this extra part, the theme, at a presto tempo in the thumb and second finger. So then combined together. And that's, okay, so this is already getting tricky, right? We have things stacked together now. We've got the theme and the filigree in one hand, and then we've got a chordal accompaniment in the left hand. Great. Then Prokofiev decides, you know what? I want to introduce another theme. So we get a break from that pattern. We get this big cadence, you know. And then he introduces a second theme. And this is shown to us in a kind of a difficult passage where we have outer, you know, the, the top of the hand is playing the theme and then the middle stuff is filigree, but very difficult. So it's all this chromatic inner stuff tricky. Okay, great. So that's our second theme. And then Prokofiev says, okay, well, how about I combine the filigree and the left hand chords with the second theme, right? Uh, uh, sorry, yeah. Cool. And you can guess what's going to happen at the end then, right? Prokofiev has set this up wonderfully. We have this middle section, the moderato tranquillo section, um, where we have the nasty, fast thirds in the left hand chromatic. And then finally, the climax of the piece, or at least the contrapuntal climax of the piece, is he puts everything together. The filigree in the right hand, the chords in the left, 
plus the left hand theme and the right hand theme. <laughs> Okay, and that's where everything goes nuts and it's crazy. And, and actually, um, a lot of that is supposed to be much softer. You know, I shouldn't always blame the piano, but I'll blame the piano. It needs to be voiced and regulated a little bit so we can't get soft dynamics so easily. Um, but okay, that's the construction of the piece. And then the final prestissimo is, is just the main theme, but at a much faster tempo and fortissimo throughout. So that's the dynamic climax. Maybe that's the most exciting section. But contrapuntally, the climax happens a little before, where we have all four parts in combination. So what's really interesting about this piece, then, is that it kind of practices itself. And what I mean by that is, if someone were to hand me the contrapuntal section, where there's four parts all happening at once, and said, you know, learn this, then I would practice it much the same way Prokofiev writes out. You isolate each section, or you put different combinations of the parts together, and eventually you end up with all four. So as long as you work through the piece properly and get each, each individual section kind of polished, then actually it doesn't take so long to play the climax. Um, it took me much longer to figure out each individual part than when I finally got to the stuff that's supposed to be the most difficult. The hand kind of knew what was going on, and yes, I had to practice it to get everything coordinated. But it wasn't as bad as, uh, as just jumping straight into it. So how did I practice it? Um, as I've said before, and this might be a recurring theme, we worship at the altar of the slow rhythmic practice God. <laughs> um, so for all of this, I did rhythms, right? With relatively, I mean, I had to make a decision. What kind of technique are we going to be using on this? And for the most part, I think I'm going to be using finger technique, where primarily the fingers are, are working. Um, you know, you might be able to get away with kind of a bounce. Um, I, I personally find it a little clearer if I use fingers, so you need to figure out the technique. But whatever technique you ultimately settle with, um, it needs to be hyper clear, right? And it needs to be very even and very controlled. And I think the best results, or the best way to get those results is through rhythmic, rhythmic practice. Um, now, in terms of differentiating the different voices, this is tricky. That's an articulation thing. When I play multiple, when I play the theme in the right hand plus the filigree, I'm trying to play the theme on the tip of my finger so that I get a different sound than on the top. Um, you can make the decision yourself what kind of sound you want to get out. I personally want kind of a sharper jabbing sound on that theme. Um, whatever you do, though, you should decide that th those need to be completely separate parts, and you have to decide how you're going to differentiate them and then practice accordingly. Now, the left hand... Yeah, all of this is just rhythms. Okay, this section... Th this section's tricky. Um, all that inner stuff is rhythmic practice, but I would isolate just just those parts. It's it's tricky because it's one of those things that you can end up faking, right? It's kind of chromatic, and there is a pattern, but it takes a little bit to figure out what the pattern is. But you know, eventually you start just kind of like, okay, cool, chromatic. You know, I'll just play some chromatic stuff. Uh, but, you know, so carefully look at that if, if you're going to practice it and drill it enough so that we want it to be second nature, but we don't want it, you know, to just start being this blah, 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 blah in the background that uh, the notes are actually not correct. Um, still, I, when I practice it slowly, I'll catch myself just kind of playing a pattern and then realize, wait, this is not right. The, hand, you know, the hands are not lining up. Now... For the most part, the rest of the technique is going to be very similar. Okay, the double third, I keep saying double third section, but the, the thirds in the left hand. <laughs> chromatic. Um, the fingering I like, I like to slide on black keys. And by slide, I mean I'm going, you know, there I go 2-2. Two, two. Um, 
that's just going to be a matter of preference, but once again, I think the best way is rhythms. I also do kind of a back and forth thing. Just to get used to the hand, you know, the positional change. I, I think a lot of it is with thirds, for me, it's balancing what the wrist is doing. Um, in fact, I think it's the same with the, the Chopin, the, the double thirds etude. A lot of it is choreographing, you know, how high is my wrist at any point in time in this? I need to kind of find a place to ricochet the hand so that it gets comfortable. For example, I definitely lift there, and that kind of gives me propulsion forward. Um, that will be individual. You'll figure it out. I personally uh, kind of like to, you know, there's 16th notes, so like every eight, I like to feel the wrist go up and kind of propel me forward through. And then, um, yeah, that's basically it. So, I mean, what's, what's nice about this piece is that if you practice it, if you practice it, I think it will eventually happen. Right? You just have to drill it with lots of dotted rhythms, very slow tempo, articulate each thing the way you want. And I think what helps with the piece is before you start playing the notes, you do have a plan for how you're going to differentiate these articulations. Okay, so that's what I've got for this etude. So to summarize, how difficult is it? Really, really difficult. This is probably the trickiest in the, in the, among the Prokofiev etudes and even among the etudes I've played, this is a difficult piece. The difficulties are difficulties. The difficulties are the thirds, um, broken, and and just the pattern in general, a bit of a finger twister, and also the stacking and differentiation of different themes happening concurrently. So the counterpoint it can get very complicated. There's really no shortcut as to how to practice it. It's a lot of slow rhythmic practice that'll be a recurring theme throughout. But I think with this piece in particular, if you have a mental map of what's going on, if you understand how Prokofiev has constructed it, then instead of having more technical difficulties or you're sitting there thinking, okay, it's B and then a G and then F, E, okay, yeah, yeah, I got that, okay, plus, um, instead of thinking about individual notes, you'll be able to think that's theme one, okay, add with filigree, and I've practiced each of these parts separately. Prokofiev writes that very well, he does it for you. And I think things will come together quicker um, than you'd expect. This is one of those pieces, at least for me, where one day I woke up, and I practiced, and all of a sudden it was like everything had kind of processed itself, and it was definitely getting there. I mean, this is a work in progress, and I'm not, it's not at 100% right now. I kind of brought it back quickly for this video. Um, and do I finally, I guess, do I think it's a good etude? Is it worth learning? I mean, absolutely worth learning as not just a an encore piece or a piece to program in your recital because it's amazingly effective. Um, but also just as an etude, this, this kind of technique um, where you are, you know, it's finger independence where you're differentiating each finger by approaching the key a little differently at the same time. That is extremely useful for all repertoire. And thirds are always useful to practice as well. I mean, thirds show up everywhere. Thirds are, I think, notorious as a difficult technique to conquer. And Prokofiev's thirds are a little nicer, actually, than a lot, um, because some of them are broken, gives your hand time to rest, and you get the right, so you get the best of both worlds, right? You get the, you figure out the right position for all these consecutive thirds, um, but it's not going to break your hand as much as, like, the Chopin thirds A2. Prokofiev breaks your hand in other ways by stacking, you know, other stuff in the same hand. So that's what I've got. Uh, thanks for listening. If you made it thus far, um, great. Uh, if you've skipped ahead to this point, also great. And uh, next week, another etude, and I hope to see you there. Thank you. <laughs>